morning, everyone. Mark Kramer for Ask the Millionaire in Philadelphia. Hope all of you are doing well. Uh, in spite of the crazy stock market, I think things will turn themselves around uh, in short order as we saw the stock market go up a thousand points uh, yesterday. And I think there's just so much opportunity. In fact, the best opportunity always comes and the great companies get started during down times in the economy. So in 2000, in 2000, 2008, every time everybody heads for the exits, the great entrepreneurs stay and build great companies. So let's answer some questions from the great entrepreneurs who are right, sending us uh, questions about how they can build their own business, improve their competitive position. Our first question is from Rohit uh, Gupta. Rohit writes, how do I determine prices for my products. We're an exotic snacks and drinks business. We sell snacks and drinks from around the world. For example, Fanta from Japan or China. Right now we're only e-commerce. We're getting a brick and mortar store in December. Our product ranges from uh, 50 cents to $15 to cover rent, utilities, etc. for brick and mortar store. Does it make sense to increase prices or keep them the same uh, uh, where they are? First of all, you need to create a spreadsheet that lists all of your prices and not only the um, physical cost of the actual product itself, but you have to factor in your time. That's probably the thing that most entrepreneurs leave out. How long does it actually take for you to shop for every one of your products? How long does it take to set it up? How long does it take to um, bring it into your warehouse or wherever you're doing? All your time needs to be calculated on there so you can figure it out. You have to figure out your uh, cost for your laptop, your cost for your cell phone, electric, rent. Every single cost has to be factored in. And then you figure out how much is it for the, you uh, know what the physical costs are, but then you divide all those other numbers into the spreadsheet to figure out exactly what your true cost is. So if anybody would like a spreadsheet to show you how to go and do that, just email me at uh, mkramer at consultinguniversityusa.com or mkramer at pitchtomefirst.com and I will send you sample spreadsheets. I can also send it to Sean and he can disperse it to all of you as well. But the key is creating a spreadsheet, factoring in all of your costs, everything you spend money on, and adding in your time. And then you'll have a, a better estimate of what that cost is going to be. And then you divide it into your product to figure out how much is it really costing me to uh, produce this product, put it out there on the market, and, and sell it to folks. So you need to get all of those numbers and I'm glad to give you some spreadsheets so you can see how I've done it for other clients and then you can do it for yourself. So we have another question from Rowett and he asked, in today's environment, how and what resources would you utilize to prepare a business plan with projections if you've not done it before? I, and he talks about his exotic uh, snack foods and his uh, sales we're very uh, low, the first uh, 13 to 61 sales on average were $32, but they're an e-commerce company. I don't know how to prepare a forecast for future as I do have the experience, what can I do? So there is business planning software out there that you can uh, purchase. There's business planning software online that you can do it. The biggest part is creating a spreadsheet. And there's really, I haven't seen any really good spreadsheets and I develop them all the time for myself and my clients. So you really need to go and create a spreadsheet that has at the top, who are exactly you marketing to and how many people can you actually market to? So for instance, let's say for your drink product, uh, you are gonna be marketing that out online. Well, who exactly are you targeting to market to? And what list are you gonna buy or what advertising you're gonna get uh, purchase that's gonna put you in front of that right group? So let's say that you go and buy uh, Google ads 
and it comes up on um, when somebody types in different types of drinks all of a sudden you come up on the side and you realize that your customer acquisition cost because the number of people who are going to click on it is X. But let's say you want to do an email marketing campaign you have to go to a list company and you're going to buy email addresses and they typically cost anywhere from 25 to 50 cents uh, a person that you're buying. Sometimes you can get more depending on who you're talking to. And so now you know that if you could buy a list, maybe you could only afford to buy a list of 50,000 that fit your criteria. So you buy for 50,000, now that's what your starting number is, but you know not all 50,000 are even gonna pay attention to your email. So you put the 50,000 in your spreadsheet and you go, what percentage of those people will actually do it? So you're gonna to have to take a best guess. But let's say that you think 50% of the people will actually click on uh, your link to see your website, see what you're offering. And let's say at that 50%, you have now 25% of that 50%, so a quarter of everybody is potentially buy-in. Or maybe you're saying it's only 10%. So now you take that 10% number, and let's say it's 10% of the 50%, so you have like 2,500 buyers, and you multiply that out by the number of times that they would buy this product. So if it's a drink product, maybe they're buying a six-pack of it, and maybe they're buying it once a month. So you can figure that, figure that out. But once you start setting buying habits and you find out, oh my gosh, as people buy it once a week like I'm an iced tea addict, now you're able to extrapolate from that and start forecasting what the revenue could possibly be. On the expense side, you've gotta get all your expenses put into the spreadsheet, everything. Your, the fees you're paying your accountant, the fees you're paying your lawyer, your, uh, your uh, telephone expenses, electric expenses, car expenses, uh, travel expenses, every single thing. And now you're gonna know what your bottom line number is because gross revenue means nothing. All that matters is what you net that actually goes into your pocket after you calculated all those expenses. So I would create a spreadsheet. And again, I'm glad to share past spreadsheets I've done and you can do that. So maybe Sean can get that out to you, but again, you can write to me at mkramer at pitchtomefirst.com. That's mkramerpitchtomefirst.com, and I will send you free spreadsheets that you can see how it's done, and then you could mirror that for your own company. So the next question is from Jonathan Baptiste. Jonathan asked, how do I determine what type of life insurance I should have? I'm a residential real estate agent. I'm looking to maximize my money for future investments. I hear that life insurance is a way, but I'm not sure what type will work best for me. Do you view life insurance as an investment vehicle or how do you view it and how do you know if it's inappropriate for me? First of all, I would suggest to you that you should go and talk to an insurance broker, not an agent, but a broker. Talk to them about different options. Uh, I did get an insurance license eons ago, and I believe in buying term insurance, just pure insurance, and investing the difference. Because with whole life policies and variable life uh, policies, you are, there's an insurance component and investment component, but if you read the fine print, they only guarantee that you're gonna get like a 3% return. You'd be infinitely better off separating that out and getting your um, pure insurance through a term policy, which is usually pretty inexpensive depending on your age and so forth. It's bracketed by age and health and a variety of different things and then taking that money and going and putting your money in mutual funds or individual stocks. But again, I'm not expert. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what the different options are. But you should talk to a financial planner, talk to an insurance broker, read as much as you can online. But if you're looking at insurance as an investment, typically it's not an investment. Just like people think of their house as an investment, but really, with the ex rare exceptions, 
of the early 90s and then just recently where houses went through the roof in terms of um, increased value. That rarely ever happens. Usually the value of the house only increases um, by the inflation rate. So you might only get like two, 3% uh, growth on your house. So what we've seen in the past two years is highly unusual. Doesn't happen very much time in history. The last time, remember, where houses went up a lot were the early 90s when people uh, were worried that they would miss the opportunity because interest rates have been coming down. So again, talk to a financial planner, talk to experts on it, and that would be uh, the best thing that you can possibly do. And do a lot of reading on your own. Read on Fortune, Forbes, other magazines, online uh, information, and be well-armed so you ask smart questions. Okay, so the next question is from Kimberly Benjamin. Kimberly asks, how do I determine direct pricing versus wholesale pricing? As a hairstylist, uh, products I product uh, retail direct to clients, and there are products I purchase at wholesale that I would like to turn around and wholesale to other stylists for them to, to sell. So you'd be like a distributor for someone. How do I determine what the margin should be for me so they can so they can make money selling it to their clients, but I also can make margin. My advantage is I can buy at higher volumes to get better pricing from wholesalers than they can get. So, if you know that you can get a your product at a very inexpensive price, and remember this goes back to an earlier question that you need to create a spreadsheet that factors in all of your costs. Because let's say you're buying uh, shampoo that you're selling out there and you're saying, I can buy the shampoo for $1, sell it in my store for $5, but I could sell it to um, other wholesalers for $3 or whatever that number may be. You have to factor in all of your cost to go and get that product. So that means uh, going online, picking the product, ordering it, all your time that's there. If you're driving and picking it up, the time it takes you to drive, the gallons of gas you're expanding, the cost for insurance to insure your uh, product. All of these things have to be factored in because you might find that you will be charging a uh, wholesaler $3 and it's really costing you $2.50. You're only making 50 cents. So unless you're doing a significant volume, 50 cents is not that meaningful, right? You know, you'd have to do, do like in the hundreds of thousands to millions to make it worth your while. And same with when you're doing retailing, you gotta factor in all the cost. You know, if you have somebody taking the orders, you gotta factor that into your spreadsheet that you have somebody internally that's taking the orders. If you have somebody that's boxing and shipping it for you, you gotta factor all that in. Cause you might find that you're charging $5 retail when it really should be $10 because it's actually costing you. When you factor everything in, $5 just to be able to go and provide this product. We oftentimes, all of us, underestimate uh, what we're charging, but we also have to take a look at what the market is charging as well. And we have to decide if the market's super cheap and we can't compete because we can't afford to buy it at the right price. This actually happened to my father. My father had a wholesale uh, drug business and he basically couldn't buy in big enough volume and have enough margins to make it work. So we ended that business and started another business. So you gotta take a look. Is there enough margin when you factor in all your expenses, especially your time and the time of the people that you have working for you to do this? Is there enough to go around? So the next question is for uh, Roselli uh, Alkalite. I'm, I'm really butchering that name and I really apologize about that. How can I determine if buying leads is better than organic reach for prospects? I own a full service accounting firm and we help small business owners with all their accounting needs. I'm growing my firm and currently I'm able to buy leads that are in need of my services and ready to buy. However, is not, however, is not guaranteed that they will go with my service. The other option is through organic reach where uh, every time consuming 
uh, to build that relationship and they might not need my services at the moment. Well, look, you're gonna do a variety of things. It's not like one or the other. You're gonna go network and you're gonna meet people and you're gonna meet direct customers when you go to a chamber of commerce event or trade show events or uh, meetups and other types of events. You might be part of a movie club. You might be part of a small business networking group, whatever that is, that's one form of your marketing. The second form of your marketing is you're gonna buy these lists and you're gonna send out emails, but you're gonna send out educational things. Here are 10 things you have to think about uh, this year when doing your tax planning. Five things to think about for the quarter. You're gonna give them educational information that at the end, if you need more information, call us. So there's a trigger for them to call you. There's a reason for them to interact with you. So you're also probably going to go out and say to offer to groups like Rotary, hey, tax season's coming up. I'd be glad to come out there and talk about tax issues and answer tax questions uh, for your membership. And with a proviso to know that what I'm saying is only based on genetic, generic information because I don't have your tax return from me. I don't know enough about your business. But if you go and network, if you go out and speak, if you go and buy a list and send information about who you are, but with information that's useful to them that they want to share, I believe in sending numbers, three things to know, five things to know, 10 things to know, never more than 10, never less than three, five's a good in-between number. And so that's what you want to do as a service provider. That's what I do as a service provider. The other thing I found that was very powerful, I have a podcast called The Best Business Minds, which ironically has won five awards this year where I interview live every Friday, like today, uh, business book authors. And it's given me great visibility and it's helped me get new clients and it's helped me get referrals and it's helped me open doors for things. So take a look at all the marketing tactics that you think will help you get in front of your target market and you're gonna have to do a variety of them. I know that's gonna take up time, but until you develop enough of a base that people are constantly feeding you business, referrals, this is the kind of things that you need to do. And they're relatively inexpensive. I wouldn't run necessary ads to acquire them. I think in consulting of any type like accounting, it's a question of how knowledgeable you are, but do people feel comfortable with you? and want to get to know you more and do business with you. And once you do a good job and you're saving people money, they're gonna brag to everybody. Oh my God, I got the best accountant. He got me back $20,000 in my taxes. And you need to be able to show on your website without naming people, here's the great things I've done for my, my clients. And when you're sending out emails to people, here are five great client stories that I can share with you where I made a difference for my client. Allow me to make a difference for you. So the next question is from Kristen Pitts. Kristen writes, what is the fastest, easiest thing I could do to grow my business from the stage I am today? I'm a wholesale in the retail industry selling golf apparel. I'm in my first year of business launching this month of October. I'm currently at 16,000 in gross sales. My biggest holdback in driving new business is my lack of cash flow to purchase product to sell. I'm currently using my credit cards. My total credit limit is around 10,000. Next year, I'd like to grow to my business to at least 100 to 500,000 in gross sales. I would really like to go after bigger retail fists such as department stores, but I'm not sure how to secure a large order without the cash to back it up. I'm limiting myself to my credit limit. What, uh, what are some of the immediate things you would recommend I do uh, to reach my goals? So there's a few things, uh, Kristen, that you can do. One is you can go to your bank and if you have assets like your house or you have collectibles or something that can be valued, you can go and get a, a line of credit from your bank. Two is you could go and get your customers to prepay for it with a, a, a nice discount. Maybe your discount's 5%, maybe it's 10%, but it's a discount where you have enough margin that you'll still make money, but they'll front the money for you. That, uh, that is quite common in some uh, businesses 
where people will do that because they think what they're getting is amazing and they want to go and access it. The other thing that you can do is ask your credit card company showing them your results and showing them your quick pay that they should increase your credit limit. And watch your uh, credit score. Make sure you're always paying your bills, that you're never late. So you get a higher credit score. Higher credit score means more credit you can get. Also, higher credit score means lower interest rate that you have to go and pay. Also, depending on your business, you might contact economic development agencies and look for grants for businesses. I'm, I'm assuming you're a woman with a name like Kristen, and there are all kinds of angel investors out there that want to invest in women companies. There are foundations that have put pots of money aside uh, for women business owners. So take a look in the region that you're in, also nationally, and type in grants for women who've started businesses, grants for women who've started golf businesses. See if there are any um, significant successful PGA players who've created foundations to help entrepreneurs get started. Maybe you might contact a major golf uh, golfer and tell them you've got this great business that you've developed and you managed to grow it and maybe they'd like to be your partner because they understand uh, that business. So there's all kinds of options uh, to help you do it. And also, since you're a wholesaler, uh, you can ask uh, the manufacturers to give you better terms. Because if you show them that you're selling pretty quickly for them, they'll give you better terms. Because essentially, you're outside sales for them that's not costing them anything. They're not paying you a salary. They're only paying you what you're selling. So it's almost like you're a straight commission person uh, for them. So again, all kinds of options for you. Wish you luck with that. And that was our last question for the day. So it was great meeting all of you. I hope uh, that you have a safe uh, weekend. And I look forward to answering your questions next month. Have a great day. Take care.